don't know if he's there. Okay, we can start. Right. We should start now? We're good to start now. Yeah. Okay, Grace is not, uh, his speaker is off, but okay, I will. I will you, you can start now, yeah. Okay, uh, okay, let, let me just get the information that I uh, saved for, for you, Professor Sakia. Okay. Um, Welcome to everyone. I hope that you can uh, hear me all right. If you have any problem, uh, send a chat message or otherwise. Uh, today, let me just get the information here, sorry. Uh, today we are pleased to welcome Dr. Mirod Sakya, who is uh, serving as a, a associate professor at um, uh, University of the West, uh, which is near uh, Los Angeles in the United States, and and uh, the title of the talk today will be that. Sorry, let me read it correctly. Um, the digital Sanskrit Buddhist Canon project: problems and possibilities. Uh, I will just say briefly on Dr. Sakya that uh, he is, um, uh, aside from his duties in teaching at the University of the West, he is also um, uh, director of the um, project that he, is, he will be discussing. Uh, the aim is to create a comprehensive and accessible Buddhist Sanskrit canon that is suitable for, you know, for modern life that we can all read and understand. Um, that is much needed because we, we haven't really had such a, a collection brought together before. Um, Dr. Sakya is also involved uh, in, in this project, I should say, it is jointly being pursued by University of the West and also, uh, as I understand, Nagarjuna Institute of Buddhist Studies in Nepal itself. So there is a kind of collaboration going on. Um, Dr. Sakya has, as I understand, um, at this point already uh, served as an editor for the publication of uh, some of these, you know, these rare Buddhist um, Sanskrit Buddhist manuscripts uh, that I am aware of, volume one, correct? And also volume two, and I'm sure there's more coming, of course. Um, he's also uh, spent time as a visiting scholar uh, in the at uh, what's called ECAI, International Area Studies, at the University of California, Berkeley. And uh, I guess, okay, I'll stop it there, uh, but please excuse me if I've missed anything important. And uh, with that, I will turn our talk over to Dr. Sakya now. Please feel free to proceed, Doctor. Thank you, Professor Dermy, and uh, for a nice introduction. And good good morning, everyone. And it is pleasure and honor to be a speaker today for today's event organized by the College of Religious Study at Mahidol University. I'm deeply grateful to Dr. Philville Chom Paul Bhait Sal, uh, the esteemed Dean of the College of Religious Study and Professor Sanjay Barwa Choudhury for extending their gracious invitation to me. And, So uh, today I choose the topic, uh, the digital Sanskrit project. Uh, problem. I uh, published this article uh, four or five years ago. 
I'll just summarize that for this today's talk. So first, I want to introduce like a of this digital Sanskrit project, uh, project goals, and what we have accomplished so far is the DSBC Tripitaka, the current structure of the digital Sanskrit Tripitaka, and the process how we do the work, and what type of tool does the DSBC project utilize for digitization. And let me talk about the existing Sanskrit Buddhist texts in Nepal and recent development, and we expanded the project, right? So we added more project onto this umbrella and future plan and conclusion. So first, a little bit of history of how we begin this. So Sanskrit Buddhist, uh, Sanskrit Buddhist work are paramount importance of understanding of history of Buddhist literature. So there are merely hundreds of Sanskrit Buddhist texts currently available throughout the world. Although thousands are known to have existed in the past. So despite the dis disappearance of many Sanskrit Buddhist texts due to various reasons, some of their content are preserved to an extent in Chinese and Tibetan translation. So for the sake of preservation and dissemination, disseminating the Sanskrit Buddhist texts remaining in the world, the University of West California, in cooperation with the Nagasan Institute of Buddhist Studies, uh, in Nepal, initiated the Digital Sanskrit Buddhist Canon project in 2003. So this project was made possible through the sheer vision of the late uh, Min Bahadur Saki, the director of NIBS, and Dr. Louis Lancaster, the Professor Emeritus, University of California, Berkeley, and also a former president of the University of West in Los Angeles. So Dr. Uh, um, Professor Saki uh, has been involved in the my father is involved in digitization of Sanskrit Buddhist texts uh, since the year 2000. And he has gathered a, a large number of printed Sanskrit texts in, in Nepal and sought a partnership with the University of West. Then the Venerable Master Shun Yun, the founder of the Fokuan San, Kaohsiung, Taiwan, and also founder of the University of West, kindly, kindly consented to be a sponsor of this worthy project under the joint leadership of Dr. Lancaster and Mr. Sakya. And then Master Shinin um, aims in sponsoring this project was to make available the original Sanskrit Buddhist texts online for all free of cost. And Venerable Master Shinin has devoted his life to propagating a humanistic Buddhism through education, cultural activity, charity and religious practice. And this project was deemed wholly in line with his mission of spreading humanistic Buddhism. So this project is not only the digitization effort, uh, but at the same time, an ambitious attempt to devise a Buddhist canon in Sanskrit. The project was named Digital Sanskrit Buddhist Canon, even though the complete Tripitaka in Sanskrit, the Sanskrit canon proper, had disappeared from the Buddhist world long ago. So the goal of the project of, uh, are as follows. So first, reconstitute a Sanskrit Buddhist canon in the 21st century by compiling all extant Sanskrit Buddhist texts whole while and creating a new comprehensive structure for these texts. And second, to make available sample of the original manuscript. Because uh, when we have the original and we match with the published one, so we can find lots of differences. We learn a lot about that. So it's the we must provide some original manuscript for, for people to view, right? And third one, we also want to incorporate and encourage, to encourage and facilitate, facilitate the feedback on the canon for all from all people interested in, interested in Buddhism across the world. So this is the home phase uh, we created. Right? So since 2005, the DSBC uh, text has been down uh, has been downloadable at no cost to the reader via the internet. Uh, so this is the DSBCproject.org. So this site make accessible very simple for a potential user. It is a user friendly site with searchable indexes to the sex Sanskrit text, while the texts themselves are easy to cut and paste into various applications. So what have uh, we accomplished so far? 
So the source material of uh, the input comprise a printed edition. So we only digitized the printed edition so far of the Sanskrit Buddhist text published from the end of the 19th century onward. The hundred of Sanskrit Buddhist texts are available in print today. Now for the first time in history, the primary texts of the Sanskrit Buddhism uh, or Indian Buddhism are becoming accessible to the world by the internet and not only as a scan image of the book page, but as e-text produced by the DSPC. So DSPC is accelerating its work by broadening its base and applying the latest computer technology. So this project has so far digitized um, more than 700 titles and which amount uh, 55,000 pages and currently 475 texts are accessible online, including 92 sutras, 15 binayas and 322 sastras. And more are coming soon. So now the question. Uh, so now the question is the DSBC a Tripitaka? Um, so one of the primary goal of the DSBC is the reconstitute, reconstruct the Sanskrit Buddhist canon for the 21st century, and much of the original content of the Sanskrit Tripitaka. Uh, the three basket of sutra, agama, vinaya, and abhidharma, has been lost. Uh, the history of the Brazilian further mention of Baitulli Pitaka, also known as the Baitulli Sutras, which seems to have contained the Mahayana texts that are more common today. In 269 CE, a monk of Abhayagiri sect of Sri Lanka seems to have embraced the Baitulli Pitaka. However, the Mahabhyana sect rejected the Baitulli Pitaka because of its uh, supposedly heretical doctrine and then later burned its text with the support of the king. Some fragments of the oldest Buddhist Sanskrit texts relating to the Uddhana Burga, Tharma, Tamapada, Ekotara Agama, and Mad Madhima Agama have been found in Eastern Turkestan. The inscription of the few Sanskrit Buddhist sutras were also found in the ruins of Gopalpura Odisha in India, dating back to 250 and 400 CE. The Pratishimocha Sutra, the main text of the Vinay Pitaka, written in Sanskrit, was found as fragment in Nepal by Bandel and more completely uh, in Central Asia. So in Nepal, the core collection of nine Mahayana texts is called a Navasutra Sangraha, or Navasutra Navadharma, is recognized. And it's also referred to nine dharma and it considered as a dharma mandala, the circle of dharma in Nepal. So it, it can therefore call the Mahayana canon containing the following title, Asta Sasrika Pragapanda, Gandhabhiva, Dasabhumika, Samadhi Raza, Lanka Avatara, Saddhama Pundrika, Tathagata Goyega, Lali Bistra, and Subarna Parabhasa. So this is the legitimate to claim that Nyar Buddhism is the variety of Sanskrit Buddhism and its collection of Buddhist texts can together be called Sanskrit Buddhist canon. Most of the Buddhist texts used by Nyoar Buddhists in the original Sanskrit language, while the Nyoar language is used for translation, explanation, and the original material. So in this way, the uh, Sanskrit is the medium that has traditionally united Buddhist Nyoar in the Kathmandu Valley. It is not necessary to maintain the sectarian identity in order to follow the Sanskrit tradition. Uh, so hence the DSBC is not trying to create a radically a new form of Sanskrit Tripitaka, but rather uh, attempting to revive the old Sanskrit Tripitaka with the material available today. It is a painstaking task because this material is so uh, dispersed and fragmented. But the project assumed that the further loss can be prevented by quick action. The content structure of the current structure of the digital Sanskrit. So in the process of construction of digital Sanskrit Tripitaka in the 21st century, the DSPC project uh, in is the process of categorizing all Sanskrit texts which are available in to us in printed, printed form. So this has classified classified those texts into the three broad category, like the traditional Tripitaka, the first division, the word of the Buddha and the teaching and his teaching, 
is the Sutra Pitaka. The second division called the Binaya Pitaka deals with the rules of conduct, Binaya, for those who live by monastic discipline. Then the third is the Abhidhamma Pitaka, reserved for the aesthetical literature. So in classifying the Sanskrit Buddhist literature, there were alternative grouping such as the 12 textual journal, Sutra, Gya, Vyakarna, Gatha, Uddana, Nidana, Itibhitartaka, Jataka, Vaipulya, Abhutta Dharma, Abhadana, and Upadesa. So some of these groupings are named in the titles of Sanskrit texts. The DSVC also adopt these 12 textual genre for its classification scheme where appropriate. However, it is difficult to differentiate each of this type from the other if a text does not state its own genre. In addition to the Abhidharma genre commentaries, Mahayana Buddhists have their own commentaries on the sutras called Sastra, Vyakya, Tika, and so on. So these, cat these are the categorically not Abhidharma. Thus, the SVC uh, classified those texts into th three pitaka, which with the third tentatively called the Sastra pitaka, the basket of treaties, and provide subcategory for each genre as shown below. So you can see in the chart here. So this is the current structure of the digital Sanskrit pitaka, but uh, we need to get scholar input and we need to refine. This is just a tentative structure. So digitization process. So digitization of the Sanskrit text had to wait until a compiling tool for converting Sanskrit material into digital format arrived. We waited so long. Uh, in the year 2003, the DSBC started to use the iTranslator 2003, the software developed by Omkarananda Ashrama Himalaya from Uttarakhand, India. Since then, the DSBC project has been using it for transcribing Sanskrit Buddhist texts. So this software allow us to convert texts into Unicode Devnagari and Unicode Roman translation file. And I translate 2003 software used the Unicode 4.0 standard coding. As a result, it is compatible with Unicode open type fonts such as Mangalam, but each page has to be typed through standard keyboard, uh, standard keyboard input. This input is currently done by the team led by uh, Milan Sake, director of Nagar Institute of Buddhist Studies in Nepal. At present, proofreading is done by the coordinator of the project at University of West in order to improve accuracy. And finally, uh, both texts in Devanagari and translation in Roman letter are uploaded to the Digital Sanskrit Buddhist Canon website. And the SPC project bears a responsibility for selecting texts to be digitized, proofreading, design, and maintaining of the site. So we can see some sample here. So we provide uh, two format. One is Romanized version on the website, and one is Devanagari. So why we put these two format, uh, two versions? Because uh, we serve Western and Eastern audience, right? So especially in India, Asian, South, South Asian. So people who are more um, friendly, uh, they're more exposed to Devanagari script, right? They love to read Devanagari. So for them, we provide the Devanagari script. And for Western who, want everything in Romanized version, so they, they can look at or read in the Romanized version. So this is the Romanized one, and this is the Devanagari. So actually, we uh, in our website, uh, we get visitors from both countries, uh, like Asia and Europe, and, and also America. So we get a hit on some people, they use more Devanagari site, Devanagari uh, text, some use like Romans, it's kind of balanced out. And so what types of tool uh, does the DSPC program uh, utilize for this? So in 2000, uh, when my father was alive, uh, he uh, was looking for like many, many software because the, the keyboard, uh, we have to use all the symbol to put the diacritic mark on the Sanskrit text. Right? So it was very tedious task to put diacritic on any especially Devanagari typing was very difficult at that time. And we found this iLeap software and it just came out in 2000. And at the same time, uh, the iTrans also came out in early, uh, late, like 1999. Uh, so we 
analyzed both software and we found that the iTrans is more uh, easy to use. But we first we uh, found this software, and this is the keyboard. So for this I leave, so we have to type all uh, Soskit alphabet, right? also a Soskit key key in. It's a little bit difficult in the beginning, but you have to get acquainted with this keyboard. So not only Sanskrit, you can also type Punjabi, Tamil, different script. Right? And then uh, we found this one is in 1990, I think in 1990, they already uh, launched the iTranslate 99 software. But now we are using the iTrans 2003. Since then, they have not updated much, but it's compatible with the PC only, not Mac. But, but we use uh, for almost 20 years for the software. It's very user friendly and also free to download. You can see how we type. So this is the one of the. So you can see there's a tree layer, right? So we we digitize uh, directly from the manuscript right now, right? So we type the key in in the codic form. It's called iTrans code, and then result we can see in the Devanagari, or you can find in both, right? Devanagari and Roman, or you can separate like a Roman or Devanagari. It's very convenient. And these are some input staff. So we hire um, very young staff because uh, so they have to actually they type for three, four hours per day. So it's a little bit painstaking, right? Because you know, you, if you type for a long time, your eye, you, you get eye uh, pain, pain, right? So we don't allow them to work more than three, four hours. Right? So just three, four hours per day. So we have more than 15 people who work before. Right? So this is the, so last year we had one uh, event. We honor all the staff who inputted, who become part of this project. And these, these are some of the people. And this is graduate from like Korea, is very young staff. And so now the question is like, why in this, uh, so in 21st century, uh, like I, uh, in artificial intelligence, AI uh, generation, right? Um, why we use the input, uh, like manually input software? Uh, so I tried some of the tools, uh, OCR tool, AI tool. So the result I found is much better. So when I went to Berkeley in 2008, at the time, some of the one guy from the UC Berkeley library, he introduced one software, OCR software, Soskit OCR, and at the time, the accuracy rate is not that good. It's like 90, 80 percentage, but now it's getting better. So that this V-flat scan the software, OCR, when I tried it, so the result is very amazing. Like, uh, so this is one of the text, Dasavamika Sutra. Uh, in, in the second day, OCR, the whole text, but accuracy is still uh, not 100% but much better than uh, 2008. So, so this maybe in future we will use uh, this kind of software to digitize. And it's gonna, it's, it's gonna save lots of uh, time and money. To, but it's not 100% yet. Still there's a mistake I found. So this is one software piece. Another one is this OCR Sanskrit dictionary.com. So in this website, so you have to upload the image of the picture, a manuscript or text, printed text, and then they will convert into uh, the, the Mangalam font. I think you can see this Unicode font they converted. Right? So this is also uh, not hundred percent yet, uh, but this is a little bit uh, difficult. You have to manually upload one page, uh, page by page to get the result. So this is a little bit, but it's also good, good software tools. So OCR Sanskrit Dictionary dot com, and then uh, what about the manuscript? So, so the printed text is easy to OCR. Is this uh, the Sanskrit because there's a lot of font uh, they develop. 
but oshiaring uh, to use oshiar software for the manuscript is a little bit hard and here uh, some of the student from uh, one uh, alexander o'neill who graduated from the uh, U uh, university of toronto now he's in uh, so uh, so it's london university of london uh, he's doing a, one project amazing project to oshia the manuscript and the result is amazing promising so there you can see here so they oshia line by line and uh, accuracy rate still we need to test but it's getting there, not that bad. So if we can do this kind of, uh, if we can make software like this one, then in future, even manuscript, we don't need to uh, transcribe. Right? Automatically, we can automate it. Right? The process uh, will be very easy. So this, uh, I think this paper was written in 2022, and they maybe re release this software soon, right? So University of London, and uh, they're partnering with other Nepalese group. This is one of the folio of heat operation. So I uh, also want to talk a little bit about the existing Sanskrit Buddhist text in Nepal. So Nepal has uh, by far the largest repository of Buddhist Sanskrit literature, dealing with different aspects of Mahayana creed and practices. Right? So it is a local monk a scholar as well as Bajasar Pandita who have contributed to producing and propagating these Buddhist manuscripts. So Nepal has historically play, played a central role in the preservation and subsequent dissemination of Sanskrit Buddhist literature. So this is uh, the map of Nepal. So most of the map, uh, most of the uh, manuscript is preserved in Kathmandu. It's not in other cities, right? So in just the three cities, Kathmandu, Bhaktapur, Lalitpur, uh, especially Kathmandu and uh, Lalitpur have more uh, manuscript. And Bhaktapur, they do have some. So we are also planning to digitize some of the manuscript from Bhaktapur. So some of the major manuscript collection and preservation effort in Nepal are as follows. So Nepal uh, National Archive. So National Archives has the biggest collection so far. Right? So uh, we believe that they have like 120,000 120, manuscript uh, kept in there. Uh, around like four, 4 million folios, I don't know that. Right? Were micro, they, they were already microfilmed and they kept uh, so Nepal General Manuscript Project they co -part, partner with the National Archive they did microfilm and 30 years ago and those microfilm recently I visited the National Archive and I saw the status of the uh, microfilm the equipment and the quality is deteriorating so we really need uh, the government so, so, should pay attention to the the, the equipment is deteriorating. We need to save them. And the second collection is Asa Archive. So Asa Archive, uh, they also have like 7,000 manuscripts. And recently they are digitizing another 2,000 manuscripts there. And Kesel Library has some collection too. And Swimbu Library uh, collection. So we plan to do some digitization of Swimbu Library too. Uh, and our project. So real science manuscript project we established in 2009. So, so far we have a 600 collection, 600 manuscript. And another, uh, my family, my father's friend, Sankar Thapa has been working on the In Danger Archive program uh, run by British Library. So he already um, uh, trans uh, scanned more than 1,000 manuscripts. So these are the collections we have. And this is the one of the images uh, of the library, uh, National Library. So National Library, uh, their storage house is not well, uh, how to say, the, the preservation, they just put in the, the, the cotton, uh, there's no boxes. Right? So the storage facility is not high tech enough. Right? So we need to pay attention to that because it's, a, it's very precious treasure of Nepal. Right? So we need to preserve this. And Asa Archive, 
So they have very good collects and um, their preservation is very high tech, especially because the, the Buddhist library from Japan, they donated um, the boxes, the wooden boxes, and it if uh, they store it very uh, well, so they're gonna so those are gonna last for a long time because the, the acid free paper they use to, in the boxes, right? So they're very high tech compared to the National Archive. And now they have a more than uh, 8,000 manuscripts. And among those 8,000 Buddhist, uh, so I also did some research and, and separated uh, so Buddhist texts and other Hindu texts. So they have like roughly 3,000 Buddhist texts and mostly uh, like ritual, sutra, uh, sutra ritual and other commentary, uh, sastras, right? But mostly ritual texts, ritual Buddhist texts. And then Swambhu. So recently, last year, we visited Swambhu in October. So what our main goal is, uh, so we identify uh, the collection. They do have like a 100, 200 manuscript. Since it's the, like one of the center of the New Art Buddhist site, right, which is Swambhu Stupa. Um, so they do have like a um, very rare collection written in gold and silver. And we approach uh, the, the main caretaker of the library and then ask for the permission to scan. So we're still in the keeping touch with the collector. Uh, if we get a permission, then we will scan all those precious uh, treasure. And you can see I'm holding the manuscript. It's mostly those, those are uh, sutras, no sutras collection, uh, Mahayana text, right? very beautiful text. And the condition uh, of that library is really bad. Uh, so after the earthquake in 2015, the whole, uh, even Swimbo Stupa has some like a damage, right? And they renovated uh, some of the Bihara nearby. And this library condition is still the same. Like the, all the books, uh, book self were damaged. And you can see that all the manuscripts are like rot rotating. Right? Their, the covers are worn out papers also very bad condition and also damp the, the water sometimes especially the uh, rainy season water leak uh, from the roof and because of that uh, the, it's easily get destroyed so uh, so that's why we approach the library collection collector and uh, ask them to permission to scan before it get bad and also we try to help them to store in a good condition so we approached some uh, collector and the, the other uh, university who fund project to put in the big boxes like and store in a good condition right? to make make sure that they keep for a long time. So we did uh, we try to help them, and we gave some book cover uh, to cover all these manuscripts two three years ago. And the second project uh, I'm involved in called a real Buddhist uh, preservation project, manuscript preservation project. So this, why we need uh, this another project since there's a, like a, a National Archive, Asa Archive. So National Archive is the very old uh, repository like where government collect all the manuscript. But the people of Kathmandu, especially the Lalipur where I was born, uh, the people, they were not, that happy to give uh, their heritage to the government or other archive in Kathmandu, right? So they want to preserve in their own city. So I belong to Lalipur. So all the people, uh, the collector, Bhattacharya, priest uh, from the Lalipur, they want to give those collection to us because since I am also the Sakya, uh, same family, same family lineage. So they trust that and you know, they they interest. That if somebody from our own family can preserve, then they were uh, they they are very uh, happy to give permission to scan, also permission to put those uh, treasures. So because of that, so we started this project, uh, especially the, my father initiated in two thousand nine, and after that we scanned four hundred manuscript right? uh, from the one one collection uh, is called Achyasura Mahabhara. 
so this is the collection we plus scan so uh, when we scan it um, we, we we didn't know what kind of manuscript we are, uh, we find so we found some very unique text in this collection so there there is a biography of the buddha in sanskrit which may be the largest so far found the variously titled sugata janma ratna abadana mala is called or sometimes tathagata janma Janma uh, Abadana Mala. So this is a unique text I've, we found in this collection. And another text is a previously unknown Tantric Buddhist compilation com, uh, called the Guhya Loka Tara Tantra right? we found in this collection. And there's a long gap, 2009 up to 2000, 2018, right? there's a nine-year gap and we again uh, got the funding from the digital uh, Buddhist Digital Resource Center in Harvard, um, Cambridge. So they gave us a grant, uh, and University of West collaborated uh, to do another scanning of 200 manuscripts from private collection. So those 200 present now we put in this website, the, the new website we built. And also they donated uh, the digital camera, Alpha Sony. It's very good quality. Uh, it's, it's like a state of art, like, um, the studio. So we can, uh, so we, we, when we scan it, the quality of this manuscript, uh, the scan image is like very high. So one, one picture is like 50 megabyte. That's very good quality. Uh, And then uh, we launched the new website last year in October. Uh, it's called uh, resbmppproject.org. So, so far we already put 200 manuscripts. Uh, so we do have 400 manuscripts, uh, but we didn't get a permission from the, the collector uh, to put online at the time. So we didn't, uh, so it's only 200 manuscripts we scan uh, from, uh, with the collaboration of the, uh, the, uh, the BDRC. So those manuscripts is online here, right? But the 400 manuscript we scanned previously uh, is not online yet. So we can see some sample here. Uh, so you can zoom in, zoom out all the manuscript. And if you want to uh, capture, you can capture it, right? And this is in uh, free of charge. So if you go to the National Archive, uh, to get one folio of the their collection, you have to pay, right? 75 rupee to two, 300 rupee uh, you have to pay. But here, our main goal is to provide this for free. The scholar, anybody who is interested, so they can just go to our website and look at uh, for their resource. And if you want hard copy, we can, uh, you have to contact us and we can also show the hard copy in Nepal. Right? But since the quality is very good, the high, high resource is much better than <laughs> original. And then, uh, so, so Nepali scripts, uh, especially uh, the manuscripts, are very hard. So they they are like a major three script must we must learn in order to read and the Nepali manuscript. So one is it's called a Prachalit script, and second one Bhujimol and Ranjana. So without knowing the script. Uh, the Devanagari script, if you know that you still you cannot read the manuscript. So we train some of the local people who are interested in this manuscript study. And we come up with this new project called Manuscript Translation Project. So we hire, uh, we, we collaborate with the Asian Legacy Library, which is also known as Asian Classical Input Project in Sedona in 2019. And so we first train those students for three months. So we first taught uh, we uh, Brazil script, and then uh, last two years ago we taught Ranjana script, and in future so we are going to teach another Pujimal script. So after the training, so we selected uh, the top student from this uh, group, and we gave them a job to transcribe, right? and some of them still working at our institute. And this is our building where we do all digitization. 
So the third floor, sec, uh, fourth floor used for the data center. And so these are the the person in the back, the with the class is a Kiran, who is the instructor who teaches Percolate for Zimbal all script, one of the expert in Nepal. So he trained this lady uh, who studied Percolate. And then we have uh, her to do the discussion of the Pritchley script. So she was, at the time she was typing, uh, so she can read the Pritchley and she type in this uh, Unicode, uh, uh, iTrans code, and then you can see the blue color is in Devanagari. So all the staff we train first, and then they learn the typing stuff. Right? It's not that difficult. And so far, uh, we have four or five uh, still continuously working, and these are one of the, our team. And then uh, last uh, two years ago, we started another project called the Dharni Preservation Project with the collaboration of Asian Legacy Library. So why Dharni? So Dharni is in least studied. Uh, uh, not many people are interested, uh, not interested, but very few people are uh, Doing research in Tarn history. So, we can handful of, we can say, like uh, Professor Ronald Davison, Dr. Uh, Gudrun Bundiman, and few, very few, right? Uh, they, they are expert in Tarn here. So, I, so I started, uh, my inter I got some kind of interest in study of Tarn, and I said, why don't we compile the Tarn here and provide it on the website? And then people can view it for free right? or study. So I started this project and it's a one year project. We come, uh, we, we put together uh, 108, actually 120, but uh, we, we just auspicious number 108. So we collected and now it will be available in the Asian Legacy Library, the, all the 108 Taranis. And we found some unique Taranis, very beautiful, hard Tarani, lots of Tarani. So uh, never seen before like those Tarani. So it will be available soon. And some new collaboration. So we have been collaborating with uh, many projects uh, in the world. And one project is called Bodhisora. So Bodhisora website, uh, they provide sound bites. So the professor from the Sanskrit University in Nepal, uh, Kashinath Nyopani. So he recorded lots of uh, Buddhist hymns in Sanskrit. He recited and recorded. So you can find all uh, in this website. And what we did, like we provided all the e-texts from the Sanskrit uh, our DSPC. So they put that e-text and you can download the text and uh, with audit. So you can read, recite side by side and then listen to the uh, professors chanting, right? So. And then uh, the second, another collaboration is called Buddha Nexus. So Buddha Nexus is a new project uh, run by University of Hamburg. So they put all the texts, uh, not only Sanskrit, Pali, Sanskrit, Tibetan, Chinese, and uh, so you can compare uh, if there's budget shedika text you can see in chinese and tibetan and, st and study study all in different languages right? so because of that uh, a scholar especially if the phd student and they can uh, see the difference and did uh, learn the comparative study of this text right? it's very useful sites and it's becoming very popular these days right? So we collaborate with them and we provided our all text to them. So we can you can see our text in their collection. Right? And future plan. So, so DSPC uh, project uh, is gearing to our creating the whole Sanskrit Tripitaka, uh, which will be the largest and most comprehensive corpus of this material created to date. Right? So we have envisioned incorporating all the texts that were composed by Buddhists. Some of these texts are not directly concerned with Buddhism, such as various work of, on grammar, lexicography, poetry, uh, poetic, and medicine. Right? While these texts are secular subject, do not necessarily assume uh, acceptance of Buddhism, um, they were written in the line with Buddhist principle. Historically, Buddhist institution transmitted many secular texts, and it is evident that the Buddhist community in Nepal and Sri Lanka have preserved many such secular texts along with the Buddhist texts. 
So the DSBC is considering digitizing such secular texts as well. So after the com uh, completion of digitization, the DSBC hopes to produce a Sanskrit Buddhist canon DVD. So the availability of the complete set of Sanskrit Buddhist texts uh, on the digital media as well as in online browsing will be a significant milestone in Buddhist scholarship. And the inclusion of an offline version will be the immensely useful, especially in the place where internet usage is not available. So this uh, will also uh, be, uh, we're trying to publish the Sanskrit Tripitaka series in the new future. So in the digital age, the hard copy is still important as printed texts can last for centuries on good quality paper. So DSBC will keep hard copy backup for the Sanskrit Tripitaka for the sake of preservation. And there is still no up-to-date bibliography of all published Sanskrit texts. So even texts which appear in print are often very hard to find in libraries. There is no central repository of these texts. So more reliable edition were published in the West, and it is extremely hard to get copyrights clearance for reprint. So however, the traditional custodians of these texts have not accepted uh, that these texts should be covered by copyrights in the first place. So at the present, uh, some edition can only be used through the goodwill of their editors and publisher. So it's very tedious task and we have uh, lots of things to be done, right? So, it's, so we need this help from the Sanskrit scholar from, from the world, right? So I, I, I always, uh, whenever I go to conferences, I always uh, ask people to volunteer help us. So this is not like a money-making project. So this is completely based on voluntary work, right? So we all uh, work uh, because this is very important. So if we don't do now, who will, uh, when we will do, right? So that's very important thing. And so we need to save these manuscripts. So in conclusion, so Digital Sanskrit Buddhist Canon project fills a gap in digitization and preserve, preserving the unique Sanskrit Buddhist textual heritage, which had been gradually disappearing from the Buddhist world. And DSBC provides a, a stepping stone for the reconstitution of the Sanskrit Buddhist Tripitaka by its traditional user, having begun to collect the surviving Sanskrit Buddhist texts around the world. After the disappearance of Buddhist texts, Sanskrit Buddhist texts in India, there are still significant number of Buddhist Sanskrit texts preserved in various locations such as Kathmandu Valley, Lhasa, Dumhang, Western Library, and other places. The cataloging and printing of those Sanskrit texts is needed to complete the digitization of this corpus. Some reconstruction work can be done from Buddhist texts which are extant in Chinese and Tibetan translation. Thank you so much. All right. Uh, thank you very much for this very enlivening talk. Um, we will open this uh, talk up to any questions that may arise. Um, first of all, uh, if you have a question you would like to ask uh, to Dr. Shakya, yeah, you can put it in the um, chat box or perhaps speak out directly if that is necessary. It looks like we have one. Dr. Shakya, can, can you see the, the chat question or shall I read it to you? Oh, yes. Uh, I it. Pardon me? Yeah, I, I can read it. Yeah. Okay. Would you please share also the accuracy rate? So when I tested uh, recently, um, the accuracy rate is, uh, is like a 90, 98, 97, like a three, four percentage uh, when we do the OCR. Uh, so this is the question about the accuracy rate of inputting. So inputting us, in a, we are human, right? So uh, our eye easily makes some mistakes. So so that's why we do like a two, three layers of checking. And uh, so I do myself a, a final editing, right? So that's why the, when we digitize something, I don't put 
uh, on the website immediately because uh, the first hand is it has a lot of mistakes. So I have to go through multiple layers of checking. And so that's why it's delay uh, our process to put online. So it's a, uh, it's very easily you know, you know you may make error when they input that. Uh, so same thing like uh, OCR. You know, OCR also not hundred <laughs> percent. The human input also not hundred percent. Yeah. So it's eighty ninety eight. So two three percent uh, we have to we we have to s spend some time to correct those two percent error. Yeah. I hope uh, that answers. Yeah. I have a question too. I'll, I'll just ask directly if I may. So yeah, um, sure. you, you mentioned, I think in the title of the talk, well, I have a, a couple of questions, but I'll just ask one right now. You mentioned in the title of the talk about, I think it was something like, uh, sorry, I don't see it right now, but it's like challenges or yes. controversies or whatever. And it yes. made me wonder, you know, are there any controversies around what texts are valid yeah. or authoritative as Pripitaka, you know, or do you have to yes. have some controversy between different people are saying, no, this is the Tripitaka, or no, this is the correct version, or, you know, back and forth when you establish what purports to be a universal Buddhist canon. Yes, definitely. Thank you for that's a very good question. So I had uh, one issue one time I proofreaded one text. Its title looks Buddhist and it's it has a a Buddhist elements in the text. And later uh, one group from India, especially the Bhimra Omerka group, they said, "Why you put input this text? This is not Buddhist text." So, no, with, so it's actually uh, some kind of uh, Hindu elements in that text. So I immediately re remove it. So I think there's lots of Sanskrit texts has <laughs> some Hindu elements. Right? Uh, we have to be careful. And uh, there's lots of new texts also coming out, like especially the poetry essays, you know, the Sanskrit uh, written in Sanskrit, uh, the Buddhist uh, natakas, you know, the drama. So some are actually is not Buddhist. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, again, if anyone has questions, feel free to to uh, speak up or put out the chat message. Um, yeah, I have one questions. Actually, maybe two or three. Maybe if I if I get a chance to ask, you know. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Shakya, for your very, you know, very enlightened talk. Uh, since you mentioned that, uh, that uh, you have a strong family lineage that I understand correctly that uh, you're preserving this text. So every, even your surname is Shakya. So is the Shakya the same, like the same lineage of the Buddha, the Shakya clan? Is, is it the, and uh, another, another thing like, uh, in the in, in the DSPC project, so you mm. categorized the uh, Madhamaka, Madhamaka uh, also under Shastra, that, oh. that, 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 that part. So I wonder that uh, is is Madhamaka or or Kosha, is it not oh. considered a secondary literature, right? It's it's Nagarjuna, right? Is 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 for Nagarjuna? Yes, Madhamaka. But but it's not. Uh, this this shastra is basically based on the sutra. If I understand correctly, shastra. Yeah, commentary work. Yes. Comment, commentary work. Comment, comment, commentary part. So 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 that, that means that uh, I mean all this Bashubandhu, uh, Asanga, Nagarjuna, their works are considered are categorized under shastra. That's shastra. Like, yes. Yes. That, that part. Okay. Yeah. So the sutra is uh, we consider it as a word of the Buddha only, right? Yeah. Buddha and previous many multiple Buddhas, not just one. Right. And other texts are considered as a sastra. Oh, so the first question uh, first I will answer. Yeah. So the Sakya, uh, so the family name Sakya. So we in Nepal, uh, we so I belongs to a temple called Hirindabharu Mahavihara. So that Bihara is very old. Like, like 
800 years uh, story. And the, the temple, so anybody who belongs to that temple, they have to become a, especially a male child. In order to join that Sangha, you have to become monastic for four days uh, at the early age, like four or five or something. So that like a like certification, like if you become a Sakya Pichu, right? and then you become um, part of that Sangha. So that's, um, and also we believe that the main shrine, the Buddha, the Sakyamuni Buddha, we treat him as like Azu, like, you know, is our ancestor. And so my father did some research and he found out that in Mula, Mula Sarvastivada, the Ananda, the Bhikkhu Ananda, who went to Himkhanda Pradesh right, at that time to meet his relative. Right? So that means the relatives, because Ananda is also Sakya, Sakya family, right? Uh, so he already, uh, some of the family already live in the Himalayan region at that time, the Sakya people, right? So that's one uh, fact. During Buddha's time, the Sakya people maybe live in the Himalayan region. So I'm not talking so about the, uh, the Kathmandu Valley, but all the Him water Sikhara, Skanda, right? Him, it can be Dharmasala, it can be all that range. Right? Uh, and then second thing, uh, after the Kausala king Vidudava, when he massacred 70,000 Sakyas out of that anger because he was humiliated by Sakyas because he was Dasiputra, right? uh, son of the Dasi, uh, Pasanjit son, but his wife is uh, Das Dasi. So because of that uh, revenge, so massacred so many Sakyas. And at that time, Sakya were running for their uh, life, and they may may have spread all over. You know? uh, they moved to many many places, not only in Nepal. That maybe they have been to different different area. So one group of them may may have arrived in Kathmandu at that time. And Buddhist literature, especially the, the Mahayana Buddhist literature, uh, in Kathmandu Valley, uh, a lot of the, uh, the Abhidhana Sutra, Abhidhana, all uh, books um, mention that. Uh, that's not part of the quality we're talking about. Uh, they claim that the Sakyamuni Buddha visited Kathmandu many times before the previous Buddha, and when he was Buddha, he also gave a talk in the Manichu. In the Manichu Jataka was taught in the, the on the spot, right? And uh, uh, the uh, another story of the uh, tigress, hungry tigress. Uh, uh, Buddha gave a in previous life. Uh, he gave a flesh and blood in the stupa called uh, uh, there's one place in buddha uh, nama buddha in nama buddha place where he personally visited and he uh, saw the disciple that oh, this is the place where i gave my flesh and blood to the tigress so there's lots of legends prove that the buddha may have visited Kathmandu, but not mentioned in the pali canon anything right? uh, so those uh, facts say that maybe sakyas are already where they are uh, in Kathmandu uh, during the Buddha's lifetime, all after the the, the massacre of the uh, Sakyas, you know, they spread it and maybe so we treated Buddha as like our ancestor. Right? You know? We are same lineage, but we haven't checked the DNA. But so we, and so the Sakya lineage continued in Kathmandu, and we have a right to uh, go for Anspeg. Uh, so we are household monk. We call Sakyavichu. So, so we are after we become a monk for four days. So we become like a Buddha's lineage. Right? Also, heritage continued. Right? So that's our answer to the first question. Right? So the uh, the classification uh, is still in the early phase, and so not only me, uh, my friend uh, Ian, Professor Ian Sinclair, uh, Doctor Ian Sinclair, is also part of this project, and he help to classify. So we have a lot of issue with this classification. Uh, um, it's a very tedious job. Uh, so we really need a scholarly output, right? uh, input, uh, and then to correct this one. So Madhimika we classify as a Sastra because the uh, word of the, it's not word of the Buddha. Right? And the Tantra is classified under the Sutra. So, so we have to make some decision. <laughs> to, uh, 
because we only have three categories, not like a, a Chinese category, a classification. Or, so we follow like in uh, Tibetan style. Tibet has a two Kanzur Tanzur, right? Kanzur word of the Buddha and Tanzur all the Sastra. So they put in everything in the Sastra basket, right? So a little bit uh, different than the other, but we inspire from Tibetan classification system. Yeah, thank you very much, Professor. Uh, one more thing, like uh, I think uh, I think also you also heard that Charya uh, Pitaka or Chonjapot in Bengali, let's say. So Chonjapot, uh, it was found in uh, Nepalese um, Royal Family Library. So if Chon if Chonjapot would be would be included in your project, so it would be categorized also maybe under Shastra, right? Charya so, Pitaka is it's Charya Pitaka. It's Charya Pitaka. So, so, so it's written in the, the ancient Nepalese, Nepalese uh, song. Sorry, yeah, there's a good Sorry, yeah, songs. Is that are you referring yeah, to song. song? Yeah. So that's a part of the uh, Sorry yeah, is a part of the uh, the four yoga, right? Uh, yeah. Right. The first yoga, uh, uh, Kriya Kriya yoga, right? Kriya yoga part. Yeah, so yeah. It's, it's under the Kriya yoga, I think. Sorry. Uh, and, and one more thing, like uh, sorry that for if I ask more questions. When you work with the newer newer language project, so newer mm. language is a very old language, more South Asian language. So of course we know that language is always changing. You know, it's yes. time to time it's always changing. So do you feel any obstacles? Like for me, my 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 myself, like I'm working with one uh, puti, uh, like an mm. ancient poetic song, so Bengali. So mm. this is the 400 years old language. So there's a huge, huge difference that because at the moment we are not using using that, that kind of idioms and phrases as well. So when you do you face any any obstacle with this and uh, how can you you when you when you when you include that part in your in, in I mean digitalized, so how can you you co incorporate? So I will give you one example. So when I was translating some texts, uh, Swami Prana, for my dissertation, uh, so I compare Sanskrit texts and also Newari texts. So I translated, I found few manuscripts, and when I start reading Newari texts, I I didn't understand what is 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 written in such an old Newari. Yeah. Like a, we don't speak those uh, in that way anymore. So I consulted with some uh, old uh, scholars, new art scholar, and they said, oh, so you have to put something after such a word. It's like a, or, or, or something like that. So we don't use that, right? So, so when we, uh, so I managed to translate that one and figure out the, the differences between new and old new art. So it's very hard, you are right. I think it's the, the 500 years, uh, the new art and uh, the current new art is completely different. And then, so Newari language, the history of Newari language is very strange too. So it's not Sanskrit derived language. It's the parent language is, uh, uh, it's called a, in uh, Tibetan Burmese. So Newari is part of the Tibetan Burmese family. Mm -hmm. So lots of Tibetan word in, in, in Newari language and also Burmese. So it's not Sanskrit, but Sanskrit word, they uh, borrowed lots of Sanskrit word later and they added, but initially it's in, when maybe, the old, uh, they use lots of the uh, Burmese and uh, Tibetan in there. And then uh, right now the national language is Nepali, so that's like a Sanskrit there, uh, the parents uh, language is Sanskrit. So it's very, it looks like Sanskrit when we talk in Nepali. Okay. Yeah, it's very difficult to study and especially the writing also, like there's the so many font, uh, the script, uh, maybe like more than 30, 40 scripts right, in the Sanskrit scripts. And we haven't thought like the Gandhara, the Korosti, Kashmiri. Uh, there's so many scripts. Even the Persili script, there's like various kinds of Under Persili, there's many, many uh, scripts. Every time when we read the manuscript, so we have to sometimes guess like, oh, is, is that <laughs> the same? <laughs> or it looks very different. So it's not easy to study new art manuscript, very difficult. Same thing like Korosti also, like the Gandhari script, so very difficult. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. why the Sanskrit studies become very difficult <laughs> language. Yeah, I can, I, I can feel that actually, you know, that it's, it's, it's a very tough and ancient and manuscript language. And Professor, that uh, uh, we know that uh, during the time of Emperor Ashoka, like, oh. 
Uh, it's a third century BCE. So that time uh, also that um, Ashoka's inscriptions, we also, also can find that present day Nepal, like uh, you know, Numbini, we can see, and even Kat nearby Kathmandu, so there's some Ashoka's pillar out there. So all are written in uh, Magadhi. Yes, Brahmi. Uh, that is a Brahman Lipi as well. So it's also happened any incorporation the Niwari manuscript have that kind of um, connection with this? Yes. This uh, so our National Archive, uh, they, the one Pandit they call it, Hemaran Sakya. So he built one big chart. He, he made one chart. It has like a, a, a progression, like a, a evolution of the script. Uh, Start from Brahmi up to Devanagari. It's like an 11 script. I think it has. I can send you the picture of that. Uh, it's beautifully like the like a middle age, the new the it's like the progression like from Brahmi to the Devanagari. The, you can see the different script. Uh, it's also include Tibetan too. In that script chart, I, I will send you whenever. Okay. Okay. Very interesting one. So yeah, the Brahmi is the main right. Uh, the Devanagari first script of Devanagari. And then many other, like the Siddha Matrika, Ranjana, Gupta Kalin script. And then the Devanagari is a very new one. Right? Not that. And Devanagari is not popular. Uh, uh, I think it's 19th century, 18th century, Devanagari become popular. So all the manuscript written in 19th century. Uh, actually, 1817, uh, they use Prachalit script. And the Pujimol is all, like, even. 18, 17, 18 century, they use Pujimol script and Ranjana a little bit. Ranjana is a beautiful script. Uh, not many manuscripts written in Ranjana. Uh, only the title of the Tibetan text they write in Ranjana script. And mostly Pujimol and Prachalit are more popular. Devanagari manuscript, only a few handwritten copies are we found. Mm. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Thank you, Professor. You're welcome. I have an additional question, if I may. Uh, I'm wondering, you know, about uh, again, maybe a sort of expanding on my previous question. Uh, I know that, um, I mean, if we call this Buddhist canon, that is, of course, quite universal. I mean, any Buddhism that whatever, you know, sectarian form of Buddhism would presumably be part of that. So I'm mm. just wondering, and, and again, this is not actually my own area of study. So perhaps you can, you know, clarify for some of us mm. to what extent would monks or scholars working in, for example, the Theravada Pali scripture based, uh, you know, Buddhist setting, can they completely accept a sort of Sanskrit Tripitaka or related uh, scriptures as kind of transcending the Pali version, or is there an actual difference that would, yeah. you know, bring about some kind of a, a difference in how, who is interpreting correctly? What is the Tripitaka, you know, is it this one in Sanskrit or with the Pali, you know, so on and so forth, be considered mm. to have authority. Is there a way of transcending that to to create some kind of a broader Buddhist canon, as you say, that would sort of render those sectarian differences less um, less stark? Yeah. So, so this Sanskrit Buddhist canon. Primarily based on the Sarvastivada text, Sarvastivada, and then uh, Mahayana, right? Mahayana Bajrayana, right? So the very few uh, Theravada texts included in this. And some are reconstructed, like in the Dharma, uh, Dhammapada, we can find in Sanskrit, but it's reconstructed from Pali, they translated. Uh, so we can also find some. So the Sarvastivada, when it's split uh, you know, during the Os Osaka period, uh, third century, uh, the Sarvastivada, they formed their own uh, fourth Sangha, you know, right? fourth uh, council. So they have a, created a huge uh, Tripitaka, their own tri Sarvastivada Tripitaka. But uh, so now it's only preserved in the Chinese canon. 
the Sanskrit one, the last of Sanskrit texts disappeared. So it's written in Sanskrit before, but it went to China and it, they translated into Chinese, but the original Sanskrit disappeared. So the Chinese monk uh, who, or Indian monk who went to China, they they gave to somebody, but not preserve well, or they put in the stupa inside and then nobody found. Right? So that's why we lost all the uh, Theravada, uh, uh, the Pali canon Agamas, right? The, the counter, the Sanskrit version of Theravada canon, the preserve in the Sarvastivada uh, school, right? So those texts disappear. Only a handful of texts remain. So if we can now reconstruct from the Chinese Tripitaka, Chinese uh, canon, all the Sarvastivada texts from Chinese canon, then we can have another set of Sanskrit texts based on the, you know, all the, the four, the five Nikayas, right? So I think Sarvastivada, they do have that Sanskrit Tripitaka, but it's disappeared, uh, which is based on the Pali canon. It's called Agama, right? So Dirga Agama, that's Sankta Agama, those are things. So, but, but we don't have, a, so I think recently the Gandhara, uh, the studies, they found some of the Dirga Agama texts in the Gandhara, Gandhara script, Koros script. Uh, we found, but very few fact fragments. Right? So that, that's, it's very sad to say that you know, those texts disappear. Otherwise we have a like, Pali canon in Sanskrit. <laughs> So, but now uh, the one we are working on, it's a uh, Mahayana, Bajrayana, and uh, some Sarvastivada texts. So, and few uh, reconstruct texts from Pali. So the, the focus in your project then, is it just on Sanskrit texts that can be seen as um, transcending sort of Vajrayana or Theravada or different kinds of sort of sectarian or Mahayan, different sort of sectarian versions of Buddhist uh, scripture. You are, you are kind of producing a canon that would sort of, uh, would not be associated with a particular sectarian no. uh, interpretation in Buddhism, no. correct? Yes. Yeah, we try to become uh, not just so if we find you know the Sarvastivada, Sarvastivada, uh, you know, they are uh, Theravada, one of the brands of Theravada, right? So if we digitize Sarvastivada, so that we put in that canon, our canon, right? So any anything in Sanskrit we digitize. So we are not sectarian, like, uh, only Mahayana texts we digitize. So that's not our goal. Any any text uh, we find in this world, we will digitize and put it on our system, right? and then we categorize it accordingly. Right? So that's our goal. So it's not just focus on Mahayana, but there's not many texts we find right? the Theravada texts. So if you find in, if you find in, Agama, uh, in Gandhara region or something in Turkestan, then we will digitize those. So right now, uh, actually, a handful of texts discover Agamas. People are working on translation, transcribing. The early sutras yeah, in Sanskrit they found. Uh, so that's that's my, our goal. So not just focus on behind the text, yeah. but that not not many texts we found so far. So those texts maybe in China in some uh, like under the stupa or something, but never uh, we haven't discovered excavated it right. And also from Sri Lanka, the Sri Lankan they have some manuscript. Uh, the early manuscript. We really need to explore some Sri Lankan texts. Uh, we haven't done that yet. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, the update. Good. And how many, uh, I, if I understood correctly, when I was looking at, uh, I found your biographical information uh, hmm. on a, you know, online, and it was a text relating to uh, I believe it was University of Wisconsin. I think you were giving a talk oh, there yes. some months ago. Is that correct? Yes, yes. Yeah, I gave yeah. a talk on yeah, same same topic. Yes. So in that I saw that you were, you know, they were mentioning that you had overseen uh like volume one and volume two. Those yeah. were those yes. were specified. Yeah. Do you yeah. anticipate a particular 
I mean, I'm sure it's not finished as you, as you are saying, the work is ongoing. Do you anticipate, uh, I don't know, uh, do you have a sense of more volumes uh, yes, yes. coming soon or later? Yeah, so uh, right now we are working on the volume three and uh, not only me, uh, Dr. Ian Sinclair is also part of the team. So uh, we actually, it's, uh, we are, we plan to publish maybe this end of this year. It's delayed because of the, the professor, Ian Sinclair, he, he lost his job and so now he's looking for another job. So because of that, uh, it's delayed, but actually we plan to publish in this summer, but now delayed to, uh, uh, we will publish in December. Yeah, third volume coming soon. So what do we did in third volume, so hundred manuscript, uh, it will be like a catalog of hundred manuscript we digitized recently. And we already digitized another hundred. So, so there will be volume three and volume four. <laughs> so it just needs some time to do work on those things. Right, of course. I mean, it would take a long time. I That's mean, from what you are saying, uh, but you're okay. thinking at least four volumes. Uh, uh, yeah. So the manuscript we have now is almost six hundred. Mm -hmm. So so far, we only uh, the catalog is based on only three hundred manuscripts so far. So the coming the fourth one will be another hundred manuscripts. So we still have a we have to catalog another two hundred manuscripts. So it will be in the fourth volume four, volume five. And we not only we can uh, the, so we also transcribe some of the text, provide some uh, the sample text from the manuscript. So it's a very little bit tedious task. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But it will be published soon. Yeah. The fourth one is coming soon. Third, third volume coming soon. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for the update again. Um, it, does anyone else, uh, Dr. Sanjoy, or anyone else want to bring up some, some more questions that may come to mind? No. Maybe uh, I would like to ask one more thing that maybe I can, we can tell that your project is a non-sectarian digitalization project. I mean, non-sectarian Buddhist digitalization project. Thanks. Yes, you are incorporating in all the traditions, not only strict with the Mahayana. Yeah. So what? Uh, so, so my background. I I want to give a little bit of background. So in Nepal, so we have three forms of Buddhism, right? Uh, so Theravada Buddhism, uh, and also Newar Buddhism, the old Vajrayana, based on Sanskrit texts, and Tibetan Buddhism. So my father and we all practice this like a tree pattern, <laughs> tree Buddhism embrace. Right? So we grew up in New Art Buddhism, which is all, all ritual, day-to-day -day ritual based on New Art Buddhism. And all the monasteries, uh, Buddhist monasteries, Theravada monasteries next to our house. So we visit all the temple every day. Uh, we go to all, uh, chant all the Pali texts. So we, so these three are embedded in our culture, right? So I cannot, if somebody asks me, are you Theravada? No, uh, I cannot say I'm, I'm also Theravada. I'm also uh, Mahayana, also Vajrayana. So it's kind of invaded in three system, right? Three. Yeah, three in one, yeah. So I don't call myself a Theravada. I don't call some Mahayans. I'm all like a three. I, I represent my uh, my belief system is belongs to all three traditions. I cannot just say I'm Theravada. <laughs> so. I practice I, my, for daily practice. I include all, and you know, I practice uh, Vipassana meditation. I also Tibetan Buddhism too, and so day-to-day -day ritual of new art customs. So Bajrayana also included. So I cannot just say <laughs> separate. <laughs> so that's my I, that's my culture, right? So, so my whole view is like you know, I don't distant uh, the, discriminate. Uh, I'm not sectarian at all. And also the um, Sakya, Sakya yeah. lineage, if I understand correctly, has traditionally been the uh, community in which the Kumari, Kumari, uh, Kumari Chatra and Kumari uh, has been selected. I mean, so it is a little bit off the subject, but it also relates to what you are saying to Dr. Sanjoy here, because 
that is of course not really strictly Buddhist in the canonical sense, but it is certainly part of Newa culture, you know. So that's why I, I note that. Isn't that the case? Traditionally, mm. she will be a Sakya. Yeah, you know? they pick, uh, especially the Kathmandu one, they pick the Sakya lineage. Yeah. Uh, as a Kumari goddess. May, sorry. Uh, pardon me. I'm sorry. Uh, if I may also ask in relation to that, is it also the case that when I, I saw the Kumari Jatra, pre, you know, previously, they have a Ganesh and um, yes. Bhairava. Are those also, those boys also Shakya? Uh, so, uh, especially the Tantric Buddhism in Kathmandu Valley, when they practice, they all those uh, the priests right, the involved in that kind of worship are from Sakya or Balasari. But the Hindu, they choose the, the Hindu Brahman stuff, right? Yeah. right. So and also in Kathmandu is a very uh, unique place, right? So we never see such kind of a, uh, like a Hindu and Buddhist, they share the same place. They live so happily, right? No conflict, no, we cannot find another <laughs> other place like that kind of. So wh what is the cause of this harmony? Right? I think Buddhism play a vital role. So Buddhism are more you know, open, uh, inclusive. So we we worship all the Hindu gods as a protector deity. So they just like a supporting Buddhism, right? In, in the Buddhist sutras, like in the Buddhist sutra mentioned, especially Mayana sutra mentioned that they are one day even the Shiva will become Buddha, one day even Vishnu will become Buddha. So that that kind of belief we have, right? So we don't discriminate Hindu. Right? Yeah. So they are part of the system, right? They are protecting us, protector deity. Even the Harati, uh, Yaksha, she is also protected the goddess. Right? So in inclusiveness is a unique feature of Buddhism. Right? Uh, thank you. Yes, very. Yeah, and in fact, you know the. I mean, you probably know this in India. Even I mean, Jainism. Uh -huh. And this is my own study too. I mean, Jainism is very actively. They actively use Hindu protector deities, yes. uh, a lot of them, Bairo also, yeah. Bairova, but others, you know, that I don't need to mention their names now, but, you know, they are all serving the Tirtankar, you know, is there, in a canonical sense, they are all there to protect, you know, but they all have mm. worship in their own right, you know, for making wealth and, you know, things like that, you know, children and money making and stuff like that for for Jains. But anyway, so yeah, thank you. I think I see a lot of tie-ins with your your own uh, cultural context. And obviously you are very uh, well suited in a way to do this because of your own background, you know, in in uh, Kathmandu as a case or Ladipur. Yeah, so I'm fortunate, you know, that uh... I grew up in a Buddhist family, and my father was a scholar, and my grandfather also practiced there. And uh, Rinpoche, a uh, lot of uh, our Rinpoche, they supported uh, my father to do work like uh, propagate Mahayana Buddhism in Kathmandu Valley. So I'm very blessed to uh, get so many gurus, Rinpoche, who supported us. And the Nagas Institute, uh, you know, the, our patrons are all the Rinpoche, uh, very famous, you know, Chokinjima, Tango Rinpoche. And they're, from the day one, they keep supporting my father. So I'm very fortunate to get so, so many blessings from the reported lamas. Yeah. And also Bazazari from our local oh. tradition. Perhaps you could uh, clarify for us then. Uh, um, I know you've mentioned your father quite a few times today. Yes. And I'm <laughs> sorry, but I don't, you know, I didn't know the details about him. Was he playing a role in some kind of preservation of yes. Buddhist texts or, or so, something else that yeah. kind of plays into your project now? Yes. So uh, he was a founder. Uh, uh, so uh, so he, he was a, a great scholar, uh, one of the pioneer. Uh, so he wrote many books on Buddhism, Buddhist art, history, uh, translated so many Sanskrit texts from uh, uh, into Nepal, in Nepali and English. I think more than 30 books he uh, and he, one of the pioneer work, uh, he published one book called uh, Iconography of Nepalese Buddhism, one of the best-selling books in Nepal, and Sacred Art of Nepal. 
and uh, research on Princess Pirkuti. Uh, he did a groundbreaking uh, research um, uh, from the Tibetan source, uh, the, on Princess Pirkuti, wife of the Sonchan Gombo in the 8th century. Uh, the Tibetan history uh, ties with the. And he did a lot of uh, research and also established the Buddhist department in Kathmandu. Uh, Tribune University. He was uh, he designed a course along with uh, Narisman, Professor Narisman. And since then, now we have uh, so many university, right? Lumini University, Lumini Buddhist. Uh, they, they branch out uh, more than seven, eight university, Kathmandu now Buddhist University. Yeah, yeah he's uh, one of the very popular figure in Kathmandu, Buddhist figure. But he passed away in 2012. Uh, so I'm continuing his legacy. <laughs> my father, my brother, and I continuing his legacy. All right, very good. Um, thank you. I, I I'm not hearing any other questions. So, so uh, Dr. Sanjoy, shall shall we say this is? Uh, oh well, I say thank you. Thank you also. Sanjoy, thank you, you so much. much. I really enjoyed talking yeah, to you. Thank you also. Another new really knowledge that I didn't know that your father was a great scholar. So oh. it's very moving that also also inspiring that you're supporting that legacy and that lineage. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, it's been a very you know uh, uplifting. We've learned a lot of new things today. So I thank you very much for your thank you. contribution, your your talk. Um, I guess we will draw the this lecture to a close. If anyone has a question, ask. Otherwise, okay, we will. Uh, 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 excuse me. We have a one ritual that uh, we take one uh, picture. Ah, yeah, <laughs> oh, right. Sure. Yeah. yeah. You want to take a photo? Who who will take the photo? Uh, Kun Grace, uh, are you here? Uh huh. Okay, okay. please uh, let us to know that when you are ready and. We can ask everyone uh, to turn on their camera. Anyone? Okay. One, two, three. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for this uh, opportunity. I've really enjoyed it. <laughs> I also want to visit uh, Mahidol in future. <laughs> Thank you so much for your talk. Uh, it's enlightening. Yes, yes. Uh, that, uh, it's a very good project. Yeah, please come to see us in Thailand. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so you are done. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Thank you so much.